Um, all right, today uh, we're going to talk about inbreeding depression and heterosis. And this is the preamble to what you will need to know to breed F1 hybrids. And so I'll spend a very brief time sort of reviewing the nature of cross-pollinated plants, then inbreeding depression heterosis. Then we'll talk uh, quite a bit about the commercial expression of heterosis. Uh, George Harrison Schull in 1908 observed that when you uh, self-pollinate lines of, of uh, corn, that the plants get very, very small, and they call that inbreeding depression. But that if you cross-pollinate them again with something unrelated, they restore their vigor and size immediately. So he says, uh, in fact, in many cases, the yield of those cross varieties out yielded the inbreds from which they were derived, and he called that heterosis. So this is just, I don't know where my little uh, pointer is. It, well, oh, there it is. So basically, if we're dealing with land races or open pollinated varieties or synthetics of a cross pollinated crop like maize, what like we talked about last time, we're dealing with a population that's heterozygous and heterogeneous. Ultimately, though, we can go through a process to develop inbred lines and produce hybrids, and we can produce F1 hybrid varieties, which are heterozygous but homogeneous. So we'll start talking about how to do that today. This is an open pollinated variety of maize. You've seen this picture before. Plants different maturities, as you can tell from whether the tassels are out or are not showing. So a heterogeneous mixture of heterozygous plants. This is an F1 hybrid of maize. The same degree of heterozygosity, but very, very homogeneous. And in fact, this hybrid might have, by coincidence, occurred in that prior open pollinated variety not very likely, but there would have been a number of individual hybrids in that OP variety that might well have looked like this, but we had no way to mass produce that genotype in order to get uh, a uniform field like that. All right, so to do that, we have to inbreed, and sort of the strategy is if you start with all of those heterozygous plants and that heterogeneous mixture and you self-pollinate, you can reach a state of homozygosity like we have in self-pollinated crops. And you can get homozygous, true breeding individuals. Problem is, when we do that, there's a reduction in performance. And uh, inbreeding can occur either from selfing or from crosses between related plants. And to show you how that works, well, just to show you in general, this inbreeding depression, you start with that original open pollinated variety, and each generation of selfing produces smaller and smaller and smaller plants. And I pointed out, if you self, you get very rapid inbreeding depression. If you utilize full sip mating design, where you're actually identifying two sister plants and crossing them together, you get a little bit slow, more slowly to inbreeding. If you're using half sibs, where you're not controlling the pollination, you're just selecting the ears from the female plants and saying, I, I know the female parentage, and there's a mixture of pollen coming in, you get a slower degree of inbreeding depression. But all of these factors lead to inbreeding depression. So basically, if you start with an open pollinated variety of maize, and an individual farmer moves that variety onto his farm in his field and he maintains his seed by selecting the best plants out of that variety each year, you ultimately get to a small population size whereby all of the plants in that open pollinated variety are related somewhat in, uh, in their heritage. And so actually, you're, you're sort of contributing to inbreeding depression through these half-sib pollinations. 
All right, some crops are intolerant. Alfalfa, cassava, and carrot, you start inbreeding in the first generation, you almost get no seed. They just will not take any degree of, of inbreeding. Maize shows severe inbreeding depression, but severe but manageable. Crops like onions, sunflowers, and cucurbits, you don't see much inbreeding depression. Of course, homozygous crops show less inbreeding depression because they're normally self-pollinated inbred, but at the same time, those self-pollinated crops can be very, very vigorous homozygous inbred uh, plants. So there, there's a little bit of a contradiction here. If a crop is normally crossbreeding or outcrossing and you inbreed, you get the depression. But somehow, our self-pollinated crops have already dealt with inbreeding depression theoretically or else they never were subjected to inbreeding depression because pure line homozygous varieties are fairly productive. Yeah. That's a good point. In fact, that's sort of a setup question. Uh, yeah, if, if you start, there, there's sort of two sides of the coin we look at today, and I'll get to answer your question in just a minute, that inbreeding depression, as you can see, maize is very, very sensitive to it. Um, and I'll show you, we'll talk about what causes inbreeding depression, but sort of the antidote for inbreeding depression is heterosis. And in fact, even though those self-pollinated crops don't show that inbreeding depression, they still show heterosis when you cross distantly related individuals together. All right, and so what could cause this inbreeding depression? Two general hypotheses. First, I'll do, deal with overdominance. It says that genetic variance for fitness is caused by loci at which the heterozygous state is more fit than either homozygous state. All right, so if you're inbreeding, you decrease the frequency of heterozygous loci, and you increase the frequency of homozygous loci, and so fitness is reduced. So this is almost like saying that instead of having a dominant and a recessive allele at each locus, you have two different functional alleles, and that the heterozygous that can produce both proteins from both of those functional alleles is more productive than either homozygote, homozygote, which lacks one or the other of those alleles and gene products. Or the dominance hypothesis, which is you know, more commonly used and maybe more commonly believed, says that rare deletion of deleterious alleles that are recessive occur, but they're masked by dominant alleles in outcrossing species, and that but they persist in populations because there's always a recurrent rate of mutation that produces more of these deleterious alleles. And so inbreeding increases the frequency of homozygotes, so it uncovers those recessive alleles that had been masked by dominant genes in a heterozygous condition. And so a lot of, so fitness is reduced. So a lot of breeders say that, well, the reason we get inbreeding depression is cross-pollinated species carry a lot of hidden deleterious alleles, and as we self them, those alleles show up, and so all of that load of hidden genetic deleterious recessive alleles is called the genetic load on that population. All right? Well, heterosis, then, is, is, looks like it's the opposite of inbreeding depression, but it's not quite the opposite. Heterosis is the increase in size, vigor, or productivity of a hybrid plant over the average of its parents. So originally, we looked at hybrid performance. You determine the mid-parent mean. You just grow the two parents out find out what they will yield and average it to get the mid-parent mean. And you say the F1 has got to be better performing than the average of its parents. Well, that's nice, and it's almost always true, 
but to have a variety that performs better than the average of its parents doesn't do much if one of the parents actually still performs pretty equal to the variety. So today, for all practical purposes, heterosis must be defined by the performance of the hybrid over the best parent. And to be useful, it's got to exceed the best parent, and it's got to exceed it by a certain percentage. We'll get to uh, Friday when we talk about development of hybrids. It's got to exceed the yield of the best parent by enough to give additional income to the farmer to enable him to pay for the hybrid seed. And, and actually, when we talk about hybrids and maize, they not only had to be better than the yield of their best parent inbred variety, maize hybrids weren't competing against inbred, inbred varieties, they were competing against open pollinated varieties. So the best hybrids had to have yield advantage over the best open pollinated varieties or farmers never would have grown them. So to sort of summarize, if you started with that open pollinated variety and had one variety over here, and you self it, you get this inbreeding depression. And then you cross it to an inbred parent from a different open pollinated variety, and you get heterosis. And yes, in fact, graphically, this is pretty much correct. Uh, you get like inbreeding from the open pollinated variety, you go down to here, but the hybrid comes back up above the performance of those open pollinated varieties. And just some data. From, from maize. This is the average yield of hybrids grown in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and 80s compared to, this is comparing to their mid-parent yield of their inbreds. And so you can see there's significant yield of the hybrids. And in fact, you could have done that comparison with the best parent yield and it wouldn't have been much difference. In maize, the inbreds are most inbreds are not, particularly in these early years, were not very good yielders at all. And just to show you in a picture form, this was a very, very popular hybrid, probably in its day was planted on 60% or more of the U.S. maize acreages. B73 line, Missouri 17 inbred line, produced the F1 hybrid. Crops other than maize, look at asparagus. Parent one yielded pretty good, parent two not so good. The hybrid more than twice the yield of the best parent. In beans, parents one and two neither yielded very good. If you make the reciprocal cross here, and I don't know why they did that, but the hybrids, the yield of the hybrid was three, almost four times the yield of the best parent. Of course, the problem with beans is it's difficult to make enough F1 hybrid seed to produce reliably the amounts needed for farmers to grow. If you look in some other self-pollinated vegetables, and these are self-pollinated vegetables, you can see that the average heterosis goes from 41 percent, doesn't do much to add solids to tomatoes, but 41, 15, 80, 29, 28, or 6. And look at the range of heterosis between different crosses, crosses between different self-pollinated lines of those vegetables. When doing these calculations, are you, are you referring to a hybrid between two already defined varieties or a hybrid between two, uh, after doing a selection process, you achieve a plant that because of the inbreeding depression is already well, actually, we, we do some of both. When we're dealing with crops that are normally cross-pollinated and we sell them to get inbreeding depression and then produce a hybrid, yeah, academically, you can compare the yield of the hybrid to those small inbreds. But in a crop like maize, that doesn't sell you any hybrids. So, so when we self and get those very weak inbred plants and then produce hybrids, we have to compare the hybrids to the best open pollinated varieties or the best varieties farmers are growing. 
If you have a self-pollinated crop like rice or sorghum, where the farmer's already gone through or, or they never went through that inbreeding depression, they're inbred pure lines that are fairly good performers and you make a hybrid, then it's very, very meaningful to compare the hybrid yield to those parent varieties. And that's what's done here. This is, we would have had uh, inbred varieties of tomato, peppers, eggplant, beans, peas, or lettuce that were being grown, and you cross different inbred varieties, and this is the amount of heterosis you get. So, so you know, it sounds like you can't lose. I mean, you've already got a good producing pure line variety, and you mean I cross it onto another pure line variety and I can get up to 80% heterosis? Yeah. It works like that. So how does heterosis work? And quite frankly, we don't know. But we're learning more and more about it. Uh, there are three possible causes. Dominance, overdominance, or epistasis. So wait a minute. Right there, that gives us a, a little bit of a dilemma. Because when we're breeding our self-pollinated crops, you know, I've already told you the only reliable type of genetic variance that you can count on from generation to generation is what? Additive, right? Because it doesn't concern itself with interaction of different alleles or interaction between loci. Just each gene gives you that additive component. Well, here we're saying, Jesus, in these cross-pollinated crops then, additive genetic variance is not all that important. And non-additive genetic invariance is very important if these are the mechanisms of heterosis. But how do you predict, control, measure? How do you work with non-additive genetic components? Because we can somewhat grasp the dominance relationships and say, okay, 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 I can sort of deal with getting dominance. And even though my progeny are going to segregate and they're going to show me some recessive homozygotes coming out, I can sort of deal with that. But boy, when we try to get our mind against interaction between different loci, which involve overdominance or epistasis, it's hard to conceptualize. So let's look at these three hypotheses. They say hybrid vigor is due to action and interaction of favorable dominant alleles. If you dis decrease homozygosity, it uncovers the recessive alleles, or, or the increased homozygosity covers up those recessive alleles, and that's good. And in fact, it's almost the opposite then of what could give you inbreeding depression, because you go to a more homozygous state, you uncover those alleles. So you say, okay, well maybe these two guys are just the opposite sides of a coin. To show you how that works, the homozygous dominant has equal performance to the heterozygote, they're both greater than the homozygous recessive. And if you say that big A, big A is 10, then the heterozygous 10 and little a, little a, zero. If you take these two parents, recessive A, dominant B, recessive C, dominant D, recessive E, crossed by sort of the mirror image. You get an F1 that this parent gives you 20 units of whatever you want to measure. This parent gives you 30. The F1 has a dominant allele at each of those five loci, so it gives you 50. And so that's how you explain heterosis. All right? So if that's the case, then, you know, if you're a persistent maize breeder over 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, you could think, well, theoretically then, I can develop an inbred plant that's homozygous dominant at every locus in the plant, and that inbred is going to be the most productive maize plant I can ever develop. And in fact, I had a close friend that worked at uh, Virginia Tech University that spent his career trying to develop inbreds of maize that were more productive than hybrids. And he failed. And, and all of a sudden, the maize breeding world started saying, well, wait a minute. Uh, 
only one in four to the number of loci individuals in a population would be homozygous if there's no linkage involved. So basically, if I'm dealing with a maize plant that has 10 loci or 10 genes, my chances of getting homozygous dominance at all of those loci is one in a million. Now let's see, we conservatively say that our maize plant probably has 100,000 or more genes. So what is the chance that in the breeding career of a lifetime that you could ever get all of those homozygous dominant alleles to line up? Pretty slim. That's if there's no linkage. Now, if you have linkage, and you have linkage in what's called repulsion phase, so that you have dominant A across from little a and linked to, do to little b and little a linked to dominant b, every time you get a crossover between these loci, you come out with recessive A's and recessive B's. And, and so linkage really messes you up. And, and so this led to the realization that this dominance hypothesis certainly plays a role in heterosis. The more dominant alleles that you can accumulate, the better you are. But this overdominance hypothesis is also very, very important. That's saying that a heterozygous locus is superior to either homozygous locus. Sort of sounds again like overdominance and inbreeding depression. So that the heterozygous genotype is superior to either the recessive or the dominant homozygote. And theoretically, you can say, yeah, well, that makes sense. If this is really two functional alleles, maybe A1 and A2, not dominant A and recessive A, uh, I can have two alleles that have different properties, heat stability, pH maximum differences, whatever, that give advantages under different environments. And that can result in stability and actually result in increased yield and productivity. The problem with that is trying to define and measure single locus heterosis is difficult if your population is not in equi linkage equilibrium. And if you want to go back and read about Hardy Weinberg and population genetics, very, very difficult to reach linkage equilibrium, all right? But then, even with dominance and overdominance, that still doesn't explain all of the possible mechanisms that give us uh, heterosis. There's an epistasis hypothesis, hypothesis that says clearly interaction between different loci. It's not the interaction between alleles at each locus that control heterosis. It's interaction between different loci. And so heterosis is very, very important. But we did a little bit on quantitative inheritance, and we looked at those formulas, and when we got down to separating the types of genetic variants, we said, well, there's uh, additive and dominance and epistatic and overdominance and interaction effects. But then I just sort of ignored the epistatic, overdominance, interaction effects because very, very hard to measure or predict or to estimate. But even though they may be relatively small in their total contribution versus additive or dominance effects, they still could be significant in producing this hybrid vigor heterosis. All right, in fact, I brought in an example that's sort of moving, research moving this direction. This is oilseed rape. This is an experimental line crossed by an inbred variety, Falcon, one of the very productive variety in Northern Europe. Here's the F1 hybrid. Here's the mid-parent value. So here's the hybrid. It's about 24% above either the best parent or the mid-parent value. All right. Well, studies looking at, at uh, QTLs from 20 low heterosis varieties and 20 high heterosis varieties identifies genes that are definitely classed as regulatory genes Th that uh, expression is related to major QTLs for heterotic performance. 
So obviously, interactions between different loci and what's an easy way to sort of picture those interactions? Well, if I have a regulatory locus that turns a series of genes on or off or regulates the expression of those materials, then clearly that might give me uh, a type of heterosis. All right, so let's move on. Uh, genetic distance in heterosis. Back in the 60s, Mall showed, boy, the more distance, genetic distance between the parents that you cross together, the more heterosis you get until you reach a point where you're crossing things that are so distantly related, you have all sorts of problems with sterility and performance, so on and so forth. But in general, over a pretty wide range, the more diverse things are genetically, the more heterosis you get. Uh, I think this was an isozyme study with Steve Smith and others at Pioneer that looked at a range of maize inbreds, so not those real wide crosses that Mall looked at, and says, yeah, there, there's a pretty good correlation between genetic distance and heterosis. Well, you know, this was, this was sort of breathtaking at the time and says, oh, now we got it. All you have to do to get the best heterosis is cross things that are distantly related, right? Well, no, that doesn't quite work either. And we'll talk about that in, in uh, a different lecture. Uh, all right, so heterosis has been reported for a wide range of crops. The commercial application of heterosis is F1 hybrids. And to some people, F1 hybrids is a bad word, but that's how you can most efficiently exploit heterosis. And if you're going to commercialize it, the value added by the heterosis has got to be greater than the cost of hybrid seed production. In fact, it's got to be greater than the cost of hybrid seed production, and it's got to be great enough that it, it uh, can pay the seed company to continue to develop and produce hybrids, but the value's also got to be big enough that even after paying for the hybrid seed, the farmer gets a significant return on his investment for that seed. What are the advantages of F1 hybrids? Maximum performance under optical, optimal conditions. I mean, very few crops can you find another type of variety that will outperform the best F1 hybrid variety under optimal conditions. But stability of performance under stress conditions. And I've seen a lot of people saying, well, you can't recommend hybrids for developing countries because hybrids are racehorses. They're finicky. You put them under stress conditions, they fall apart. <laughs> you know, I, I wish at some point in time somebody would collect and present some data because when you look at hybrids under stress conditions they usually do better than most other types of varieties or as well as. So a lot more stability. You can get uniformity of maturity and plant types which certainly helps mechanize your agriculture and if we're going to be productive in agriculture we need mechanization. I mean let's face it human labor is, is uh, becoming more and more expensive and uh, it it's, uh, just doesn't get the job done. Machines can do it more efficiently. Uh, it gives you proprietary control of your parents and the pedigrees of those hybrids. And we'll talk uh, in about a week and a half when I get back about commercial versus public breeding programs and, and why that proprietary control or intellectual property protection is important. It's reduced time to cultivar development. I mean, we go through an extensive step of selfing for five or six generations to get inbreds. So how is developing F1 hybrids, how does it take less time than developing half sub varieties? Well, when you go through half sub production again with non viands, you'll find that every time you do that selection part of recombination selection, you have to do it under conditions under which the farmer is going to grow that crop. So you can have one generation of selection per year. When you go to inbreds to produce hybrids, 
it's almost like it's not a copy of it's the the original that single seed descent was copied from you can go through several generations of inbreeding per year because you're really not evaluating those inbreds to be grown under farmer conditions when you finally get back to the f1 hybrids so the fact that you can do two or three are in the rush years to get bt genes out onto the market four generations of maize a year oh yeah you can go through an inbred hybrid development program a lot faster and uh, you can improve lots of traits simultaneously because you can select on either side of your parent inbreds with slightly different combinations of desirable traits and you don't have to put all of those into one variety under development what are the disadvantages well seed production is costly and it's more complicated you got to develop and maintain pure parent lines you've got to control the fertility to ensure that you get hybrid seed produced you have to synchronize flowering so that the male plant pollinates at the time the female plant flowers and farmers cannot save F2 seed do hybrids work well here's what the best farmers and public maize breeders in the US were able to accomplish with selection of improvement in open pollinated varieties from 1866 to about 1930 as you can see improvement of varieties was flat line there were some variations from year to year to year but uh, basically we didn't make a lot of gains in the 30s starting with double cross hybrids and then single cross hybrids maize breeders finally started producing some increases in productivity what is the importance worldwide in agriculture uh, these figures are out of date this is 2002 data basically so the percentage of plants as hybrids have increased for all of these significantly for rice